Hey everybody, I'm Ben. All right, so depending on whether you read the agenda on the little lanyard you've got or uh, read the abstract that was posted on the website, you may have come into this talk thinking that I'm gonna say you should stop testing. Uh, first one I'm gonna call out is that that's not the case. What you can't really convey in text is that the emphasis is on the word writing. Stop writing tests. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a way that you can, rather than writing tests by hand, you can start generating tests. Before I get into it, the, all these sponsors come in to make today happen, uh, post probably one of them, and all the sponsors, oh, sorry, the sponsors are volunteers, speakers, you guys, everyone showing up. Without all of those happening, today doesn't happen, so it's really good to have everybody in the room. There's my much, much larger than life size head. I haven't done this on a screen this big before, so normally I say slightly larger. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter or something if you want afterwards, and yes, I'm a consultant at Telstra Purple. So what's relevant for today is that I started my life in software seven years ago or so as a software tester, and then a few years later became a developer, and I found that the tests that I wrote, which were pretty good when I was a tester, all of a sudden were not very good when I was a developer. So going through some of the reasons that that changed, and recently I've been reflecting on how I could make that better and sort of buck that trend. So the trouble with testing. Probably some of you in the room have seen some of these problems. Uh, it can be hard to find time to write good tests. For example, you've got lots of other things you to do. You need to write documentation. You've got to actually build the features. You want to, I don't know, go to sprint review meetings and all those kind of things. So I'll help, with that. I'll help out with that today. It should be quicker to write them. You also avoid main, uh, writing tests because you don't want to have to maintain them, especially when you're in early stages of a product that changes a lot. And if you have to rewrite your test every time you change something, then A, they're not really that useful tests, but it also just contributes to people not wanting to write them. So we'll help with that. You might not know what to test. Again, we'll help. Uh, it can be hard to find edge cases and, and find bugs. Uh, well, again, I'm gonna help with that. This last one is that you still end up with bugs no matter how many tests you write. I don't know if I'll be able to necessarily help you with that, but at least give you some ideas and at least you won't have to write the test yourself. So no wasted time there. So the technique I'm gonna to talk to you today about is called model-based testing. Anyone in the room done it before? I know at least one. And only one, okay, cool. So it's new for most of you. Uh, basically model-based testing allows you to describe a system in a way that a computer will understand so that a computer can test it for you. Like all good things, it starts with three steps, and the first step, step one, is to create an abstract model. That is the model for the model-based test. Abstract model is a bit of a weird way to phrase it, uh, so we'll start by making the abstract concrete with an example. We'll talk about a stopwatch. Imagine the old school stopwatch with a time that goes around, the start button, the stop button, well, probably the same button, and then a reset button. And we think about what state this stopwatch could be in. So for me, I've decided to model this with a zero state, which is when it's sitting at zero, a running state when it's turning around, and a stopped state when it's not. And then you think about what you can do to move between these different states. So in our case, we've got two buttons on the stopwatch, a main button and a second button. Now that we've got these states, we essentially turn it into a diagram and draw some arrows for how it works together. So you can see here, we got a zero state, press the main button, and we end up in a running state. The great thing about this diagram is you can show this to other people and figure out really early if your assumptions are wrong, uh, if you've modeled the system correctly, or how it should behave. So a picture is great because you can show that to anyone, your neighbors, your uncles, your nieces and nephews, uh, your product owners, business analysts, Sorry, I can remember that word. Uh, and testers, anyone on your team can have a, an opinion on this. A picture is worth a thousand words, or in this case, it's worth a thousand tests. We talk about how we want to bring testing, uh, bring testing forward and, and shift it left. Uh, and if testing is really about giving us confidence in the products, then doing it as early as possible is the best thing we can do. So back to our example. How does this help us write tests or not write tests? 
Well, if we look at one in isolation, you can see we've got a zero state, which is our initial state. You press a main button, which is an action, and then a running state, which is the final state. If you're familiar with like BDD tests or a given when then acceptance criteria, this is your given when then. All this diagram is, is those acceptance criteria drawn together, joined up. You can model pretty much anything as a finite state machine. It's really useful for user interfaces because they are state machines. Uh, they have an, a state that they're in, they don't do anything until you make some action and then they end up somewhere else. But it's not just user interfaces, you could also model your business logic and those kind of things, like if you've got CQRS, uh, you can fire commands and do queries to check the results. Like I said, you can model your business rules. This is an, an order, for example. Uh, you don't want these to be too complex. So if you looked into this ready for shipping state that's on the screen, you might think there's actually a lot of stuff that happens in the background, but we're trying to write these tests from the user's perspective. So ready for shipping is probably enough for their point of view. You can model anything, user interfaces, business rules, or dogs. Uh, this is my dog. My dog does four things. My dog sleeps, my dog is idle, it eats, and it's got this thing called zoomies. If anyone has a dog, they know what that is, probably. If you don't, it looks a bit like this, running around randomly in circles. Uh, I don't know what causes a dog from, to go from idle to zoomies, that's why I put question marks there. But I know that once it's been in zoomies, it goes straight to bed. So one nice thing about graphs in general is we can represent them in ways that a computer can understand. Uh, this on the left generated that on the right. So it's really weird reversing that. Uh, so this markdown on the left is a language called Mermaid. If you use GitLab, it's kind of built into their uh, read markdown previews. If you use VS Code, you can get a plugin to do it. But that means you can put this documentation in with your code, so it all stays together, it's easy to keep it in sync. Another example is using a library called xState. Uh, I've never done it on a screen this big. That's probably big enough for you to read, but if it wasn't, the important bits are here. So you start with, well, you list out your states, you say in the sleeping state, on the wake up event, I go to idle. And one nice thing about xState is that it's got a little visualizer tool where you can click around and actually do things, which is kind of nice. It's really good to visualize and, and share that. Uh, and you can just play around with it. So you can build this JSON object basically and test your system, make sure it works the way you expect. So I mentioned xState. There are a couple of other tools you can use for model-based testing. Uh, some of the more modern ones that are kept up to date are GraphWalker, which is a Java library, but it's also got a visual graph, like a, a visual tool to edit those graphs. AltWalker has a wrapper around that for .NET and for Python. Simulator I haven't used, but I know it's a thing, and xState is probably the one I've used the most, so my examples use xState, but we're not really gonna talk too much about the tools today. There are a whole bunch of other ones that are like enterprise tools or stopped being maintained 15 years ago kind of thing, so it's not a new concept. So step one was to create an abstract model. Step two is to help the computer out. Computers are really smart, but they don't know everything that we are trying to do. They don't know how to test a system, but once you tell them how, they can do it for you. So we've got to tell the system how to test it. In this case, we need to fill in the actions and the assertions. So you may already have a test that looks like this, where you submit a click a submit button and then look for a success message to appear. These are the important bits for us. Uh, you might have more in your setup, I guess, but, but for us, we just have the actions and the assertions plug them into a model, and we go from there. But it's not just clicking buttons in a user interface that you can do. This example using curl, we call an API and check the results. So you might, you can, you can test your APIs as well as your UIs. Or if you want to apply your test at the unit level, then you can use your domain models if you're doing DDD and those kind of things. So back to our example, when we're at zero, we want to make sure that the thing is pointing straight up. We press the main button by actually pressing the main button and check that the thing is moving around. Then at some point, press the main button again, it should stop. If we press the second button, make sure it's back at zero. Step three is pretty easy. 
Step three is where the fun stuff happens. That's how we generate the tests. So how do you generate tests from a picture? Well, you follow the arrows, and then you decide when you want to stop. Following the arrows is just that. We've got that picture, and we'll, we'll walk through one in a sec. But how do you decide when you want it to stop? You know, we could just do that forever. Realistically, you'll probably want to stop either when you've hit every state or when you've visited every transition. Uh, but it's really up to you. You can do model-based testing that runs essentially in a random order, and it would never stop until you tell it to. So in our example, we start at the top, we go to the zero state, and we check that we are at zero. Then we press the main button, check that we're running, press the main button again, check that we're stopped. At this point, we've got two options. We could either press the main button again and go back to running, in which case we end up in one of those loops that you could just stay in forever, or we can press the second button and check that we're back at zero. So I plugged that model into X state, and it generated 10 tests for me without me doing anything, essentially. Just a bit of code that I copy-pasted from a blog post, uh, and then you get 10 tests for basically nothing. I wouldn't have written 10 tests for this, probably, so I got better than I was going to get. But I mentioned earlier that maintaining tests is a bit of a burden, and change is inevitable, so how do you update these tests when things change? Well, if we go back to our example, uh, some people in the room may know what I missed. Anyone else have a think about it? And I'm going to go through how, or oh, one way that you could uncover the, the gap. So if we move these from a, a diagram into a table where the initial states are on the left, the actions are on the top, then you fill in the cell with basically what, what it should end up at. So fill in the ones we know from zero, press the main button, and you end up in the running state. Or from running, press the main button, you end up in stopped. And you can see we've got two gaps on this table. Gaps, funnily enough, are where the assumptions are and where the bugs are. So going through this process is really useful to actually find those edge cases and to define what the behavior should be. In our case, when we're at zero and we press the second button, which you could also call the reset button, we stay at zero. That's easy enough. But this other gap is less obvious. If you're running and you press that second button, what should happen? Uh, Maybe some people have thought about that more. Basically, stopwatches have a lap state where it stops actually turning around but keeps timing. The idea is you can stop the stopwatch, write down a lap time, and then resume. So now our table's kind of full, except that it's not really, because we've found there's actually another state. So we put that at the bottom and go through the process again. If we're in lap and we press the second button, that's the resume function, so it goes back to the running state. But what about if we press the main button? Uh, I'm going to assume for the sake of this exercise that it does nothing and just stays in lap. But it's also possible that it would go back to stopped and go to the right time. I'm not really sure. So what do we do with our diagram now? Well, we have to make some room. And then we have to add the lap function. Now our diagram's changed. It means we need to regenerate our tests. Uh, that's just following the arrows again. I'm not going to walk through that. But plugged into xState, and now I have 37 tests. In this case, you can see at the bottom, it says resume count two and unlap count two. That's because I've let it do two of each of those loops. I think realistically, that's probably overkill for testing the stopwatch. You could have just had one. And I think if I did that, it came out with 17 tests, not 37. So maybe a bit more manageable if you want to run that uh, with every build. And that's it. We've got three steps. Create an abstract model, fill in the assertions, generate the tests, Question mark, question mark, question mark, profit. That's what we're here for, right? So model-based testing comes with some challenges. Uh, there's a learning curve that's a new approach for almost everyone in the room, except for me and one guy at the back. There aren't that many tools around, and some of the ones that are a bit old. Um, so I went over some options that are reasonably new and, and maintained. And it can be hard to get the model right. Uh, as you saw, I modeled the stopwatch and still missed something. So I guess you've got to keep that in mind. Uh, my suggestion would be to make your model simple because they're easy to get right. You're not going to try and test your whole application, just parts of it. There's no such thing as a perfect model. There's only a useful one. But with these challenges, you get a whole bunch of benefits. I think the chief benefit among those is that 
you get a better understanding of your app and a shared understanding because you've got this artifact in, in the diagram that you can show to anyone to build understanding, find those gaps early and prevent them from ever getting into the product. The next one is that you get better coverage and finding edge cases. In this sense, it's not coverage as in code coverage. A model-based test doesn't care how many if statements you've got. You've modeled it from the user's perspective, so you're getting the user's perspective in terms of your coverage. And it also helps you find edge cases, like we, we just went through. It's quicker to write tests because you didn't have to write the tests. And it's really easy to make changes. You, know, you just update the diagram and it all works again. So in my view, model-based testing is the logical progression from automated testing. We started in a world where we had manual testing. A person would write out a script and then manually go through those steps. Then we thought, actually, computers are kind of better at that. They're faster at it. So we'll still write the tests, but now we'll let a computer go through and execute them. Whereas with model-based testing, we let the computer even do that step. So the computer will generate them and then it will execute them. Basically, stop writing tests, because computers do it better than you can. Thank you. Uh, I've also got a Git repo. If